Thank you so much, Anna. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for the opportunity to tell you why we think golden rice should be allowed now. I'm going to give you a little history first. I was born here on the northwest tip of Vancouver Island in the rainforest by the Pacific. I didn't realize how lucky I was growing up on the tide flats playing by the salmon spawning streams until I was sent off to boarding school in Vancouver at age 14 where I soon learned city ways, finding myself at the University of British Columbia studying the life sciences, biology, biochemistry, genetics, a little forestry, the biggest industry in British Columbia. And then in the mid-1960s, before the word was known to the general public, I discovered the science of ecology, the science of how all living things are interrelated and how we are related to them. In the late 1960s, at the height of the Vietnam War and the height of the Cold War and the threat of all-out nuclear war and the destruction of the environment at the time, I became a radical environmental activist. <laughs> Can't seem to get it to go that way anymore. <laughs> I found myself in a church basement with a like-minded group planning a protest voyage against U.S. hydrogen bomb testing in Alaska. We proved that a rather ragtag looking bunch, that's me under the P in 71, could sail, could sail a boat across the North Pacific, provide a focal point for media attention to opposition to the tests, and help change the course of history. When that H-bomb was detonated in November 71 at Amchitka Island in the Aleutians, it became the last hydrogen bomb the United States ever set off. President Nixon, at the height of the Cold War, canceled the remaining H-bomb tests. Here I'm driving a small rubber boat into the first encounter with the Soviet whack factory whaling fleet in the North Pacific in 1975. We confronted the whalers, putting ourselves in front of their harpoons in our little boats to protect the fleeing whales. This got us on TV around the world, bringing the Save the Whales movement into everyone's living room for the first time. Four years later, factory whaling was banned in the North Pacific and by 1981 in all the world's oceans. Here I'm sitting on a baby seal off the east coast of Canada in 1976 to protect it from the hunter's club. I was hauled off to jail, the seal was clubbed and skinned, but this picture appeared in over 3,000 newspapers around the world the next morning. Eventually changes came to Canada's seal hunt regulations. Why did I leave Greenpeace after 15 years in the top committee on the front lines around the movement? First. We had begun as an organization with a strong humanitarian component. That's the peace in Greenpeace. To stop all-out nuclear war and the destruction of human civilization. Over the years, Greenpeace gradually drifted. The peace kind of got lost and became just green. And now humanity was depicted as the enemy of the earth, a cancer on the planet. I do not have that orientation. I'm an ecologist. I know humans are part of the ecology. We're all one with nature. We come from the earth, just like all the rest of life. One of the tragic problems with the extreme green movement is they portray humans as separate from nature. The primary lesson of ecology is that we are one with nature, and that's what we should be teaching our children, not that we have original sin and that we are the evil ones and nature is all good. Secondly, the sharp end of the stick for me, as a science background, it ended up that I was one of five international directors and none of the others had any formal science education. They're political activists, uh, social activists, etc. And they decided that chlorine should be called the devil's element and that Greenpeace should launch a campaign to ban chlorine worldwide. No amount of argument on my part could convince them that this was not a good idea, partly because chlorine is the most important element for public health and medicine adding it to drinking water, plus about 75% of our synthetic pharmaceuticals are based on chlorine chemistry. In other words, chlorine saves lives. It's also, with sodium chloride, an absolute essential for all life on Earth. So I could, couldn't stay with a policy like that. And also, Greenpeace had drifted into sensationalism, misinformation and fear, and the abandonment of science and logic. Here is a Greenpeace demonstration in the Philippines with golden rice equated with death. What do mothers and fathers who often have little education, the very poorest of poor, with children, what will they think when people are telling them that if they feed their children golden rice, it will kill them? 
or give them cancer when in fact it is meant to cure them. To begin with, we are all genetically modified. Every single person in this room and every living thing on earth that's been created through sexual reproduction is a mixture of the mother's and father's genes, a rather random mixture. Genetically modified is being used now to just mean transgenic biotechnology. But genetic modification comes through sexual reproduction, whether it's people choosing their own mate or through arranged marriage, which is the same as conventional crop breeding, where we choose the plants what we're going to put together. <laughs> through mutation breeding, as has been explained, with both chemicals and radiation, and marker-assisted breeding, which is an advanced form of conventional breeding because we know the genomes now, plus transgenic breeding. Genetically modified is now used as a propaganda term with negative connotations like Frankenstein food, killer tomato, and Terminator seed, all scary Wood Hollywood movies that are complete fantasy, and the opposition to this technology is based on fantasy as much as those movies. There's nothing invisible in there that is going to hurt you. And so says these organizations, just getting the general issue out of the way to begin with. All those organizations, plus many more, say that GM food is safe, period, just like any other food we eat in our daily lives is safe. Here is the global uptake of GM crops. Today, 17 million farmers who want GM seeds are planting them in 28 countries. That would be 128 if it weren't for all the ridiculous restrictions that have been put in place by legal and political means, on an area twice the size of Germany. Yet as Klaus says, no one's got a headache yet. This is one of the reasons farmers want GM crops. They see this and other examples. This is a bean on one side, a conventional bean on the other side, a bean that has been engineered to be resistant to the Colorado potato beetle. If you were a farmer, which seeds would you want? In India, in 2002, genetic cotton was introduced. Since then, cotton production has more than doubled. More than 90% of cotton farmers buy GM cotton seeds either from Indian companies or from international companies that are in partnership with other Indian companies. And production has gone up to the extent that they can now export 30% of their crop, whereas previously they imported 20% of their crop, and they have a 20% increase in average per capita income from growing GM cotton. And Vandana Shiva and others claim they're committing suicide because of GM cotton, when in fact suicides have gone down in India in exactly that period since GM cotton was introduced. The International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington has done an extensive study, and that is their conclusion. Vitamin A deficiency in preschool age children. Here's the map. It's not just in Africa and Asia. It's also in Latin America, especially in Mexico, <clears throat> where they have unfortunately chosen to breed their corn to be white. It's a cultural thing. They want it. They don't like yellow corn as much as they like white corn, so they bred the beta carotene out of their corn. And this has inadvertently resulted in this deficiency. This girl survived vitamin A deficiency so far with only going blind in one eye. But 250 million preschool children are vitamin A deficient. I appreciated Sally's presentation because it was a constructive critique rather than an ideological rant, but she might have mentioned the extent of the problem. More than 2 million people die from diseases related to vitamin A deficiency every year. It is by far the greatest killer of children today. More than malaria, more than HIV AIDS, more than tuberculosis, more than anything. And it is not a disease like those others where you have a problem of trying to kill a disease agent to cure it. It is simply a micronutrient deficiency that can be cured with vitamin A in the form of beta carotene. There is Professor Ingo Potricus and Professor Peter Beyer at the development of golden rice. They are humanitarian scientists who knew of this problem, and this is why they did it. They tried to do it with conventional means, but could not. The only difference between conventional rice and golden rice is that it contains beta carotene, an essential nutrient. It is absolutely impossible that this could have any harm, yet Greenpeace claims that there could be unforeseen health issues with golden rice. 
They have the nerve to say that there could be a problem from a health angle when two million kids are dying from the lack of this substance. The precautionary principle, they say, sorry, the precautionary principle is about weighing the risk of doing something versus the risk of not doing something. The risk of not introducing golden rice is continued two million dead kids every year. The risk of introducing it is nothing. There is no risk of introducing it. There's no law against green vegetables in this world. There's no law against vitamin pills. And they've been available for a long time, yet two million kids still die every year. Why? Why, if these things are available? Because they're not available to these people. 250 million of them scattered across the tropics. If you put it in rice, they buy rice now already and eat it every day. So when they buy their rice, they will get their vitamin A. It's simple and logical, and that is why so many humanitarian and science organizations support this program. It was not complicated from an intellectual property point of view. Ingo and Peter used intellectual property that belonged to other people to produce the golden rice. They then negotiated with Syngenta, Monsanto, and others who owned those things, and they were given them free under certain circumstances. They're not totally free because they're not meant for big multinational commercial organizations to grow golden rice for free. They're meant for farmers in the developing world where this problem exists, to get the trait for free and to give it to the people for free. And not only that, there's no need to buy new seeds every year because rice is self-pollinating and every golden rice plant produces seeds that will produce more golden rice plants. So once it's out, it will be out for good. It is sustainable. Vitamin A pills are not sustainable over 100 years. The point that it may not cure the most malnourished of the kids who have vitamin A deficiency and some may not live despite golden rice is not a valid argument. What about the kids 10 years from now, 50 years from now, and 100 years from now? The kids that aren't yet chronically ill but still do have vitamin A deficiency, it will give them the vitamin A and they will absorb it. So it may be that a few people today who are extremely deficient when it comes in will not be cured by it, but most will, and from then on all will, who eat it. So this is a total red herring that it might not work for the worst cases. It will work for almost everyone, and then from then on it'll work for everyone. Here's the organizations involved with the development of golden rice. These organizations are quite confident that golden rice will work. It's just a, a simple case of logic. It's gonna have it in the rice, you're gonna eat the rice, you're gonna get vitamin A, and then you won't be vitamin A deficient. That's why the Helen Keller International is in there, and why the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is in there with their professionalizing of international aid. They have top people working for them who know what they're doing. And they wouldn't put 10 million bucks into this if they didn't think it was one of the most promising ways to resolve this problem. Just a couple minutes. Here's the Golden Rice Field Trial at the Philippine Rice Research Institute. They are here, as Sally mentioned, putting the rice trait into the local varieties. Greenpeace says golden rice will contaminate the local varieties. No, it's going to be put into them on purpose so that the farmers can grow the same strain of rice they were growing before. Here's a group of urban activists supported by Greenpeace destroying that rice trial in the Philippines in August 8th last year. This is a crime against humanity. It's actually a crime, period, against the law. And these people are being tried now for doing this. It's been proven conclusively in healthy children that golden rice is taken up, the, the, the beta carotene is taken up and turned into vitamin A. So as long as a child is healthy enough, they will take up the vitamin A. And then from then on, there won't be any vitamin A deficient children anymore if they're eating golden rice. This man is my hero. He's a scientist at the Rice Research Institute. And there he is. Greenpeace says golden rice is a Trojan horse for GMOs. Why do they say that if they don't think it will work? If it didn't work, then it wouldn't be much good for the reputation of GMOs. They say it because they know it's gonna work and they're afraid of that. If they admitted there was one good GMO, they'd have to admit there might be others. And then they would be re reduced to a rational discussion of the subject like the rest of our, us mere mortals. But they stand on high with their decree and two million children die every year. 
That's why I say it's a crime against humanity. They're against the cure. They raise money on being against the cure. They say there's better ways, and they don't spend one penny on better ways. Not one penny. They put the money in their bank account and say there's better ways. That is immoral and a crime against humanity. So I'm getting in that horse with that scientist because I know who won the battle where there was a Trojan horse, and I invite you all to get in that horse with me. Come on, let's get in that horse.